In this scene, we're going to be taking a look at the flow modes. We'll start with the fundamental building block of the flow field, the cell vector. And we'll see how to generate these vectors using different inputs known as flows. We'll explore the effect these flows have on particles, from the basic default and random modes to the more advanced shader, spline and surface modes. So let's get started. Alright, so this video is about the XP flow field object and specifically about the flow modes that it generates. Now to help us understand how it generates those flows, it's really good to understand what the flow is and what a flow field object is made up of. So the basics of a flow field is that it's an array of vectors. So you can see in the viewport here, we have all of these different arrows and they're in a grid array and they're actually in the center of a cell. So essentially, if I move this target around, because this flow field is in target mode, as I move it around, you can see these vectors change and respond to this input. And this particular input happens to be a target and, and that target here is a null. So what exactly is going on inside the cell? Well, if I hide this 3D demo I have here and we jump to this 2D demo and I just jump to this camera, it's a parallel camera, so we're flat on. You can see that we have pretty much the same setup, but we're viewing it in two dimensions and it really helps us to understand the basics of what's going on here. So I also have a, a, a cloner object, which simply is there as a cell visualizer. So our cells are 80 by 80 and they each have these these vectors inside them. So if I zoom into one, let's zoom into this one, and I'll grab the doodle tool. You'll see the center of our cell is exactly here, and the bounds of it are this full 80, they're exactly 80 by 80, and obviously in the three dimensions, it's got these Z as well. But for now, we're just gonna deal with it in 2D because it helps us to understand. So we have our X axis here, and it even goes negative down here. And then we could do Y here and so on. So that's Y and this is X. And this is our vector inside the cell of our flow field. Now at the center of that cell, we can think of the coordinates as being zeroed out in the dead center. And then if our vector is say over here, say it's moved two on X and two on Y, our vector would be two on X, two on Y. And then that gives us two things. We actually derive our direction from that. So you can see it's now pointing in this direction. And also we can uh, extract the magnitude or the length of that. And we can even multiply and drive that, that length as well, depending on what effect we want on the particles. But the main thing here we're concentrating on is the direction. So what happens if I move this target null? If I move this target null only in X, and I just move it over to here, we actually get sort of a mirror image. And this new vector here would be known as, so if it was exactly the opposite, it would be negative now on two. So it would be negative two on X and positive two on the Y axis. So that's it, that's simply what we're talking about when we talk about vectors here. And the flow field object is made up of an array of these vectors. And if I zoom out, you'll see inside our flow field, inside each cell is a different vector. Now these vectors are driven by different inputs depending on which flow we select. So that's the fundamental of the flow mode. It is essentially a way of generating different vectors within these fields, within each of these cells. So our current one is set to target and in target mode, it asks us to add a target object, to link a target object and it happens to be a null in our case. And if I move that null around, our vectors are all changing. So you can see as I move it around, the vectors are updating. Now, that is the fundamental idea and principle behind the flow field. You have different inputs generating different vectors within these cells within the flow field object itself. And that's what's going to give us our really interesting flowing particle motions. Okay, so let's actually start looking at some of those flows specifically. And we'll go down the list and look at all the each one in turn and understand where is best to use which. 
Okay, so here we are in a new scene and we've got different systems for each of the different flow modes of our flow field. So the first demonstration is the default mode. So let me click on this top one here, it's called default. And our flow field is set up, it's completely default. In fact, if I hit reset to defaults, you'll see there's no change and we are at a cell size of 40. The flow field is at 400 by 400 by 400. And you can see our vectors, our flow vectors are all pointing along Z plus. And that's actually a local Z plus, which means that if I rotate the container, those arrows and vectors will be relative to that. So they'll move with that. So this is very simple. And I've got an emitter with a, a trail object attached to it. And if I hit play, we'll see that our, our flow field diverts the particles in that Z plus direction. Now we can change the strength and the rate at which that re redirection occurs. And I can drop it down to really low and you can see that's a much more gentle curve. If I drop it back up to 5% there, you'll see it's a bit sharper. Now in this mode, default mode, the cell size actually doesn't matter at all. If I increase it, you'll see there's actually no change to the flow because they are all in exactly the same direction. So there's no change and therefore you can actually get away with a cell size of exactly the same size as the whole flow field container itself. Now this might seem like a fairly simple flow field mode and it is, it is the default of course, but where it's quite handy is when you combine it with other ones. So if you start duplicating these, you can actually create these interesting flows. So let me just move that along Z like that and then if I rotate it you can see our arrow our vector is pointing up now it's still Z positive but it's now world Y positive as, um, instead of just local so if I do this a few times we can actually end up getting back like so, so this is a, a way of really having strict control over the direction of your particles you get this interesting looking flow and if I hit play now you'll see we get them and they combine and we get this interesting looking flow. And of course we don't have to just do it on the YZ plane there, we can do it, uh, we could rotate them out so they come out to another side. So if say if I take this one here and I rotate it out this way, we'll fire the particles off in the X negative direction and out they'll go. So whilst it might look simple, the default is actually quite useful when you combine it with other, other flow fields and also uh, duplicating them. Okay, so that's default. The next one down is random flow mode. So if I open this system and activate it and unhide it, we'll take a look at what we have here. And let's just take a look at the emitter so we can see what it looks like without the flow field on. And I'll hit play and you can see it's just a ring emitter. It's, a, it's a, in circular mode, shape mode, and it's in ring only. And then I actually have a kill modifier just to keep it efficient keep it to a, a capped number of particles. And if I go back to the flow field, you'll see that it's in random mode. And when I activate it, we get this really nice looking curling flow. So what's happening here is each of these cells has been given a random vector. So those vectors that we've looked at before, in default mode, they are all facing along the Z plus axis. So they just push the particles along Z plus in local space. In random mode, they are facing all different directions. So as a particle moves from one cell to the next, it gets given a new direction. And that's why we get this really interesting looking flow. Now, cell size has quite a big impact on the look of this, um, this mode. So what we can do is we, if we increase this to say 80, the flow will become much less fine and less detailed, but you'll get these larger curls like so. And conversely, if we go to a much smaller size, say 20, and we go change the display mode so that we don't see those vectors, so it's nice and clear, you'll see that's much, much tighter. And we can, of course, layer these up. So if I duplicate these, and I make uh, a much larger one, and as you can see, that introduces sort of larger curl shapes, and it combines with the finer curl noise and we end up getting this really nice customizable turbulence system almost with these two flow fields. And you can stack those up as many as you like um, to get different sort of shapes and detail. Okay, so that's the random flow mode. And next up is the shader flow. So let's uh, minimize our random and hide it. Let's activate our shader mode and unhide that one. 
Let's go back to frame, frame zero and have a look at what we have inside this system. Now I have a couple of emitters in here and I'm actually going to disable the static grid one and we'll come back to that and explain that in a bit. But we just have our usual, we have an emitter, it's a spherical emitter, has a, a trail object attached to it. And then we have a flow field. Now the flow field is currently set into default mode. And as you can see, it just pushes them along Z plus, of course. So I wanted to show this being set up from scratch because it's uh, it's quite interesting seeing it develop. So look at this flow mode here. We're going to change it now to the shader mode. And that unlocks all these options down here. The ones we're going to be interested in mostly are the shader. So let's add a shader. Now, the shader... Uh, mode flow mode of the flow field works best with things like a, a noise shader and so that's what i'm going to demonstrate it with but it does work with uh, the other ones you can use uh, even bitmaps as well but it's much more interesting when you can animate the flow so i'm going to add a noise shader here and you saw immediately the uh, the vectors inside the cells change directions and we have sort of almost random in alternating directions and you can see as i press play that's created this quite interesting curling noise. So if I change the scale of this shader, if I increase the global scale, you'll see the flow gets a bit smoother, still changing directions quite frequently, but that's quite interesting. Now, if I go back up to our main section here, currently what's happening is, is the shader is being converted so the colors inside this shader are being converted from a color vector to a directional vector. So if I jump into the noise, it's obviously it's made up of these two colors. And then if I open up the white color, we have RGB, obviously red, green, blue, but that's a three uh, component vector. And so obviously we can actually take that three component vector and convert that into a directional vector. So if I, if I sort of play around with these, you'll see the direction of the flow actually changes as I change the color of our noise, quite dramatically so in, in some cases. So this is a really fun way of, of controlling the particles using the flow field. Um, there's a good demonstration of, of exactly what's going on here. If I decrease the cell size to something really fine like that, maybe even five, you can see how dense that gets. But what I can also do is I can say brightness to strength. So if I do brightness to strength, you can start to see our noise shader represented in our flow field. Now I'm just using this for uh, visual representational purposes, but you can see there we get this nice sort of uh, green color where the where the sort of the larger parts of the noise are, the white areas. So if I change the contrast on this, you can see, we actually can see the noise shader is three-dimensional within the flow field. And the color actually comes from the size or the strength of the vector. So it's taking the black and white values of the color, so the brightness value, whether they're dark or light, and changing that into a, to drive our strength value. And of course, if we go to our display tab, that's actually what's uh, being represented by our vectors. Now, if I put direction only on, you'll see the blue ones actually shrink to their zero size. And we can actually see this noise, sort of almost like a sculptural volumetric noise. And I can play around with this contrast. And you can see there, I can even go as low as that. And you get these kind of very interesting flows. Now, if I put particles through this right now, it wouldn't look particularly interesting because if I press play, you'll see they flow through, but they only hit some areas of the of that noise. So there's, they're being affected only in the bits that they, they pass through. So what's really cool is that we can actually animate this noise. So if I press pause again, come back down to our shader, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna reduce the contrast a little bit. There we go. And then I'm going to animate this noise. Now, if I hit animation speed uh, up to, to one there, and I right click the shader up here, I can actually view that evolution, see how that's gonna change like so. But we can also see it in our flow field. So I'll go back to the flow field and you have to activate this option here, animate flow. So it means it's gonna keep checking the shader and whatever shader, the, the state the shader is in, it's gonna apply those vectors to our flow field. So I'll hit play here and you can actually see the flow field is evolving. In fact, I'm gonna turn the emitter off and you can actually see the flow field is evolving. Now, a good way to see this is 
is if we have particles that are not moving in the field. So they're not moving themselves. They are, they are emitted in the same spot, but they're just going to change their direction. So let's go back to frame zero. And this is the exact reason I have this one here called static grid. Now I'm going to turn off our flow field for a second, and I'm just going to nudge one frame. So we can see that this emitter is just emitting particles in a grid arrangement. And if I go to the object tab, we can see it's a defined emission and it's a grid of 60 by 60 and it's spaced out so that they are fitting within our flow field. Now, if I go to the emission tab, we can see that they are of, of a zero speed, but also that they are, they have a lifespan of one. So essentially they are born and they die and they're replaced by a new particle. And the reason for that is that I'm going to demonstrate moving through the moving this emitter through the field and that allows me to do so uh, i should also note that on the display tab the particles are set to gradient parameter mode and they are going to use the direction mode so as they change direction they will uh, change color so jump back up to our flow field let's reactivate it and you can see we can actually turn our our vectors off for this for this demonstration and i'm just going to hit play and you can see there's a very subtle change in the color, and that's because our strength is very low at the moment. So I'm actually going to increase that, and as I increase it, you can see, you start to see a representation of our noise. Now, it's quite blocky at the moment, and that's because our cell size is quite high. So you can think of the cell size in this case as a resolution. So if I hit 10 like so, you can see it becomes much finer, and we don't see the blockiness anymore. So that's really cool, and you can see the animating flow much clearer this time. But if I actually turn that off, and let's grab the emitter and the axis, and if, as I move it through, you can see our noise is three-dimensional. And this is why the noise shader is so nice to use with this, with this particular mode, is because it's actually a three-dimensional noise, whereas a bitmap would just be two-dimensional all the way through. Uh, we can actually emulate that if I go back to my flow field and I display the vectors and I go to general tab. Now if I jump to the to the noise shader and I make the z-axis really really long almost as if it's infinitely long like so and I, uh, I'll actually turn the, an the animation off and just make it really high contrast you can see if I look down one side that noise shader is represented two-dimensionally or sort of planar along the z-axis only. So that's kind of how a bitmap would show. And let's drop that back down to 100. And we can, of course, hide our vectors again. So back up, display tab, show the vectors like so. And then let's hit play again so we can see our, our grid. So you can see I'm pushing it through the, the grid. And we're getting this really interesting evolving noise. We can also play around with the strength parameter to kind of see how it changes the look. So if I reduce it down, this is the rate at which the particles are, are sort of changing their direction. And you can see if I have it at 100% when the noise is quite high contrast, let's reduce the contrast. You can see all of the ones within the, the dark areas are changing quite dramatically and all the ones here aren't changing at all. So let's make that much smoother gradient or a smoother noise and you can see we get a much smoother transition from direction in the actual particles okay so obviously we can create lots of interesting looks with these shaders they work really well with static particles but also when you pass particles through the actual grid itself there are a couple of other important parameters to consider with the shader um, flow mode and that's these color to direction modes now this is a, is a way for us to actually uh, tell the uh, flow field to interpret our shader differently. So I'm going to say red only, and we can think of red as the x-axis in some cases. So I'm going to hit uh, this other option, which is zero non-mapped colors. And essentially that allows us to restrict this effect to an axis. Of course, some of the particles, depending on their initial direction, will actually find a way to change plane in the flow field so you get these really interesting looking effects sort of energy field effects almost and if i change it from red only to green only we should uh, see it on the y-axis like so and likewise blue only will do the z okay so that's the shader flow mode it's very cool for creating uh, again custom noises and, and controlling it using evolving animating shaders
Let's take a look at our next mode, which is uh, the spline modes. So let's turn off this system and we'll open up our a long and two spline and reactivate it. And you can see here we have a flow field and it's in default state at the moment. Uh, we also have an emitter and uh, a helix spline and we also have a kill, I've actually got a kill modifier which is just the same size as our flow field just to contain our particles. Uh, but if we go uh, up to the flow field and set that up, if I deactivate it we'll just see what the particles look like. They're just colored based on their direction and they're firing off in all directions. But when I activate our flow field, and I'm going to change the flow mode, of course, to a long spline. Now, when you do that, it activates a few uh, different things. It activates the fall off and also this objects field, which is the where we're going to drag our helix spline. So let's just drag that into there. And immediately you'll see the cell vectors of our flow field um, are flowing along this spline. So if I zoom in, you can see we've got these blue ones here as well. The blue ones are actually uh, at zero strength and th this is dictated by the fall off here. So uh, just to introduce you to the fall off setting initially here, you can see the distance is set to 50 and that's 50 units away from the spline object itself. So if I increase that, you'll see the strength increases and decreases as, as it goes down. So if I increase it up to say 100, uh, we see these blue vectors of course, like I said, go to the display tab and that's because we have the direction displaying only. So essentially it's not scaling these arrows, these vectors based on the strength and that's quite a useful display mode. So I'm actually going to turn the direction only off and you can now see nice and clearly our spline and its fall off and you can get an idea of where the vectors are going to affect our particles. Now the the spline is live, so if I move it around, you'll see our vectors all update. And they are consistently moving along our spline. So this is actually tangential. And if we take a look at a little diagram, just quickly, to understand exactly what's going on here. So let's go back to our flow field, and we're in the along spline mode, which actually means that the nearest point of this spline, it will... the flow field will take the tangent of that nearest point. And what is a tangent? Well, let's let's get the doodle paint tool up. And let's just say we've got a a curve like this or let's do a let's just do a simple curve like that. And say we have a, a, a the cell is say here of our flow field and the nearest point to that cell is this point on our on our spline. So what the, the, the tangent is, it's useful to know what, what the normal is as well. So that all the, the, if we drew a normal off this spline, it would be like so. And then if we did the tangent, it would be along here like this. So that's 90 degrees to the normal. So you'll see it's kind of exactly, it looks a bit like a Bezier curve, if you're familiar with those. And that's our tangent there. So what the flow field is doing is it's taking its direction from that tangent. So actually the tangent on the inside of here, the direction would be that way. So if I go back, let's turn our doodle paint off, go back here and you can see that in effect, if I play around with the, some of the spline parameters itself. So like I said, the, the flow field is active. And if I change the shape of our helix spline here, you'll see that the vectors inside the cells react and they point along the spline. So let me go back to default there. And let's see what it looks like when we actually put some particles in the in this particular scenario. Because of the fall off uh, and I press play, you'll see that the the particles do get redirected somewhat, but because they're firing off in all directions and the fall off is quite narrow, you can't see much going on here. And also the position of the emitter itself has a big impact as well. Of course, it's not very near the spline at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to align that emitter to our spline. And this is quite a good way of rigging these up. So I'm going to add an align to spline tag and I'm going to add it to our spline path. And now I can actually move that along and emit our particles along this spline. Uh, you can see they're still firing off in all directions. And that's again, because of our fall off being quite narrow. So I'm going to increase our fall off to say 100 and you'll see it'll capture a few more particles but still they're kind of flying off in all directions. If I turn it off completely 
no matter where the emitter is inside the flow field, it will grab the particles. It'll actually direct them. So if we look from the top here, you can see our vectors are all spiraling along and they even the ones in the top right corner here. So it's like having an infinite, there's no fall off at all. So, and also we can see our, our particles aren't actually getting up all the way this up the spline and that's because the strength, the rate change isn't high enough. So if I increase that to 100%, you'll see it perfectly follows this it flows up this helix spline like so. And we could, uh, we could rotate this spline. It doesn't really matter what orientation it is, as long as it's within the flow field. And you can see them moving along there. As soon as they leave the flow field, they'll, they will no longer be uh, influenced by this spline. In our case, they actually get killed at the edges. So let's just reset the position of that spline. Just going to right click those, like so bring that down of course we can we can actually have a different uh, radius at the beginning and the end we can create this nice looking sort of tornado effect and that's really cool okay so that's the uh, the two spline mode now one that goes hand in hand with this uh, sorry that was the long spline mode that so something that goes in hand in hand with this is the two spline mode so i'll jump back to this flow field here and i'm going to rename this one a long spline and I'm actually going to make it uh, a little gentle, let's say 50%. And let's bring our helix back down to here. And I'm actually going to hide the vectors of this particular one so that we can get a nice clear view of what's going on with the two spline mode. So I'm just going to duplicate this, this particular flow field. And I'm going to set it to two spline. And then in general tab, flow mode, two spline. And then the helix is in there and then actually we'll put the display on for this one and again we'll turn the fall off on so we can see nice and clearly what's going on here and as you might be able to predict by the name the vectors near the cell vectors near the spline are going to point towards the nearest point on that spline so if we go back to our doodle paint you can see our cell vector uh, our cell here and let's jump here and it's going to the center if the center of the cell is here it's going to point to the nearest point on our spline so if we have another cell here the nearest point on the spline is here and the effect that this gives us is it actually creates sort of an attraction towards the spline or actually a repulsion if we invert it so let's um i'm going to leave the the along spline on I'm actually going to remove our emitters uh, align to spline tag and move it away a bit. And you'll see now the particles get attracted towards the spline. Now, if I move it out of the fall off, of course, it's not going to affect anymore. And you can see what's happening is we're kind of getting these sort of static effects where they actually get stuck on the spline. And that's because our two spline is very, very strong at the moment and it ends up in this sort of equilibrium and they actually end up cancelling each other out and remaining static. So what we'll do with that is we'll make sure our, our long spline is strong enough and we'll reduce down our two spline value. So there we go. And it moves along like so. Let's put our align to spline back on so we can put it at the end of the spline. And there you go. So you can see we can create these really interesting looking effects of flowing particles. And this is really useful when, when working with fluids as well. So if I go back to the two spline, we can also see here we have this invert. And we've used this before. Now the invert simply inverts the all the vectors in the flow field. So of course, if I change the two spline and I invert it, it's going to push it away from the spline. So you can see we can create different effects using just sort of the, the, the main parameters here and using different input splines. Uh, and to demonstrate that, let's actually add a different spline. So let's do a star shape. We'll do the classic five point star. And let's shrink that down a bit. And let's make sure that that's associated. So let's remove our helix spline. And if we select both of these, if I just right click the objects field, whilst I've got them both selected, right click, reset to default, that just means that it's cleared them both. And then I can just drag the star in and now that's done both at the same time. Now, uh, let's turn our helix spline off and make sure our align to spline is the star. 
and you can see I can move our, our emitter around this spline, hit play, and you can see it moves around it. Now you'll notice that it doesn't perfectly follow that spline at the moment, and that's because of the resolution, the cell size of our two flow fields here. So to, to, in order to follow along a little bit closer to the actual spline shape, you'll need to reduce down the cell size of your simulation. And also, you'll, you'll want to balance out the, the parameters so that they stick nicely to our spline. Uh, it's not, not a great way to get an exact interpretation of our spline unless you go really small with the cell size. It's more for sort of flowing the particles along these shapes. Something else important to note is the spline order, the point order of the spline. So we have this uh, star here, and you can see the particles are flowing clockwise around it at the moment. If I invert the direction of the spline, the particles will go the opposite direction. So if your particles are going the wrong way, just reverse the, the spline. Okay, so that's the, the spline modes, and they're really fun to play with in the XP flow field. And combining those with the other flow fields is also great fun. So I'm going to close that one off now. So let's hide that and take a look at the surface modes, the surface flow mode. So let's open up this system. And let's activate them all. I'm actually going to turn off the object emitter for now. And also I have this follow surface, which will become handy later on. But for now, we can just focus on the, the simple geometry we have in here. So take a looking, taking a look at our system, we have a flow field currently set to default mode. And we're going to change it to, we're going to start with, actually, we're going to start with surface normal. And then that, uh, reveals some similar parameters or similar fields that we had in our uh, spline mode. So it's asking for a an object. And I'm actually going to drag this connect object in. This just makes it easier for me to swap out geometry and test different shapes and, and meshes. So I'm going to put that in there and immediately you'll see the flow field updates and our cell vectors are pointing perpendicular to this surface, this single polygon here. So what's going on here? If I go to the display tab, and I'm just going to turn direction only on just so we can see the fall off in action there. And again, fall off is just simply a distance from that surface and set to default of 50. And if we take a look at this polygon down here, it's just a very simple one sided polygon. And it's got two materials on one is a blue one, which is the back of the surface. And the green one is the front. So that's the front side there. And you can see the vectors, the cell vectors are pointing away from that surface. They're pointing along its normal. So what do we mean when we say normal? If I uncheck that uh, connect object and I select the polygon and then I go to this options up here, I can actually display our polygon normals. So I'm going to turn that on and you'll see immediately that polygon normal is facing perpendicular 90 degrees out of that polygon. And you'll see when I turn our flow field, or sorry, reactivate our connect object, it shows our vectors pointing along the same direction. If I go to the back, you can see it's only on the one side. And now if I rotate this, you'll see that our vectors, our cell vectors are following that normal exactly. So basically they'll find the nearest polygon in to the cell and then they'll create the vector from the normal of that nearest polygon. So if I subdivide this polygon, let's just do U and then S, and I, uh, oh, sorry, that's uh, U and, T. there we go. Uh, and I can do, just say do two, or let's do one subdivision to start with. And let me rotate some of these polygons. And I'm gonna rotate them around the center there. You'll see that our cell vectors follow that normal of that nearest polygon, like so. So of course, this is going to work much better with a more complex piece of geometry. And we actually have a torus here. And I'm going to swap that out and put that in there. And you'll see that's now updated. And you can see the advantage of using our connect object. I can just switch in and out different objects. And you can see our, poly our, our polygons of this. And if I select them all, control A in polygon mode, you can see our normals. And you can see the cell vectors are the, using the nearest polygons uh, normal to generate their direction.
So what effect does this have on the particles? Well, if I go to our flow field, you'll see currently it's set to direction. If I increase the strength of that quite significantly, and I'm actually going to use this ring emitter, which is down here, hit play, and you'll see it moves up. And it's re currently, because it's set to normal mode, it's actually repelling the particles. So we've actually created sort of a, a way of repelling our particles away from the object. And if I move our emitter around, you'll see that they will be pushed away from the, the object itself. So if I then go to the flow field itself again and do invert, we create an attractor. So it's actually the, they're pointing to the inverse of the normal, which is towards the object. We actually get this kind of really cool looking equilibrium where they get sort of flowed into the center of this torus. And I can um, transform this torus, I can rotate it, and you'll see they update, and if I move it slow enough, they will actually catch up and actually follow that. And you can see down here, I've created sort of an equilibrium area where they just get stuck, essentially. So if I do this, they'll flow along towards the, the polygons like so. So that's a really nice mode. Now, if I deactivate that one, but I'm going to duplicate it because I want the same settings, and I'm going to name that original one normal. And this one, I'm going to name tangent. And of course, let's reactivate that. Let's go back to frame zero. And now, instead of the surface normal, I'm going to change it to surface tangent. Now, the tangent, just as it was with the spline, is 90 degrees perpendicular to the normal. So it actually means that we get a, a flow around the surface. And if I, if I hit play now, you'll see that the particles kind of get flowed around the surface. They kind of move around it. You can see they're particularly uh, pronounced. And this effect is really best shown when you emit particles and constrain them to the surface of the object that you're emitting them from. So let me demonstrate that. Let's, uh, well, first of all, let's turn off invert. Invert just simply changes the direction of the, the tangent and you'll get a similar looking effect. But let's, um, let's activate our follow surface and you can see the follow surface is already assigned to uh, have the particles follow that uh, torus surface and then I'm actually going to turn this emitter off and turn the object one on and this is simply an emitter that's emitting on the surface of our connect object. So if I hit play you can now see the particles flowing across this surface and you get this really nice looking flow of particles. Now, something that really, really affects the, this, the surface tangents, these, the tangents of our polygons, is the, the normal, of course. So if I invert the normal, so if I actually pause that simulation, go back to zero, and let's uh, hit, use loop selection, so UL. I'm just going to grab a few of these loops, and I'm going to actually reverse them. So if I bring up our commander and I hit reverse normals, U and then R, it's the shortcut, you'll see they flipped over. And if I undo that again, you'll see the surface tangents are affected. They do change. So now let's have a look what that looks like when we press play. And you can see when we have a change in the normal, a more dramatic change, you get a more dramatic surface flow. So with that in mind, looking at more complex surfaces and complex topologies gives us a much more interesting look with this particular mode. So I'm actually going to deactivate the surface tangent system uh, and normals. I'm going to close that up. And I've got this other one demonstrating flows. And it's actually using more complex geometry. So you can see here we've got this scan. And if I click on it, it's been retopologized. So it's got smooth polygon flow. But there is plenty of changing topology directions. And if I actually get the loop selection, you can see, you can think of these almost as a flow uh, and 90 degrees to those polygon normals, if I select those, will be our tangents and they'll combine. And if I go to my display tab, it's already connected up, you can see here. So I'll go to my display tab and if I show the vectors, you can see it's using the head as its source. So let's hide that again. Go back to the general tab, just check everything's good. Yep, then the emitter is emitting on the surface again, and let's hit play and see what happens. So you can see now we're getting the same effect we got on the torus, but because this is more complex geometry, we're getting these really beautiful looking 
streams across the surface. If I look at the back of the head here, which is a, a completely flat surface, you'll actually see that because the normal and the tangents aren't changing, we actually get a consistent flow of particles along each of those tangents. So the topology and shape of the geometry is really important to how it's going to affect the particle flow. Something else that affects it is also the cell size itself. So if you think, if I put the display back on, go back to frame zero, it's quite dense at the moment, which allows it to kind of interpret quite detailed parts of the mesh. If I increase it to say 60, we get a much larger cell size, of course, and what that results in is a much gentler flow of particles. So we can see here, we can combine those, of course, like we did with the random, and you'll get these really interesting flows. So this is a particularly fun one. I really love the look that you get from these, these really nice flowing particles here. And that can look really cool in uh, FUI and sci-fi stuff. Okay, so that's the surface modes, very similar to the spline modes, except using polygon normals and, and uh, tangents instead of the spline tangent. Next up is the target mode. Now this one is really simple. So let me open this one up, activate it. And we can see here, well, this is actually what we were using to demonstrate vectors earlier on. And simply put, go to the flow field itself. When it's in target mode, it exposes these parameters and it requires a target object. And I can add the target object and then this null is the target and I can move it around and you can see the vectors all point towards it. So if I hit play, our particles are flowing around and they will follow that target like so. So that's really cool. And there are a few other parameters in the target mode that allow us to kind of change how it works. And you can think of this as sort of like a custom attractor. And in fact, if I just hit invert, this actually becomes a repulsor. So we can actually move it towards the emitter and it'll actually fire the particles off in the opposite direction of where the target is, like so. So that's really cool. Um, down here, we have a few options where we can resize. When, when you add the target object, uh, you can have it move. So when, as we move the target, the flow will follow around. So if I turn those off and you have to hit resize to, to, to match the size of the target. Now, if we change this to 100%, it becomes uh, a lot stronger, the effect, and it'll, it'll push the particles away strongly or attract them if I change it back round. But we can also try in a different uh, field mode, and if, I, if we try acceleration, you'll actually get some very interesting looking effects as well. So you can see it's accelerating the particles, and some of them even escape the flow field. And this will look really cool if we add a trail. Put that in there, go back to frame zero. I'm just gonna turn off the color data, and I'm gonna reduce the number of particles right down. And you can see there, just playing around with the different modes in the target, you get some really interesting controllable particle flows. Okay, so that is a simple one, but it's very useful for redirecting and directing the particles. And you can kind of get some interesting sort of gravitational looks with that one. And the last one on our list is a really interesting one. It's called particles flow. So let's hide our target. Let's go back to frame zero and unselect it and take a look at our particle system. So if we open this up, we've got a default flow field. I'm gonna uncheck that whilst we, we take a look at the emitters themselves. And we have these two emitters. And as you can see, one of them is a static field of particles and the other one is a moving. So this one's the moving particles. And in fact, let's rename those. Moving static or I could even call those flow field because that's the one we're going to link with the flow field but for now that's fine uh, I'm going to increase the number of those particles so increase that to 10,000 make it nice and dense and then let's take a look at our flow field so I'm going to deactivate the static particles for now and just keep our moving particles active and let's activate our flow field and change the flow mode to particles as you can see the part the that reveals a very similar kind of UI to some of the other modes that require source inputs. So our object that we want is our moving emitter. And you can see when I drop that in, immediately the flow field changes. 
go to our display tab. Let's actually drop the transparency right down to zero and uncheck direction only like we did before. And you can see the direction in our cell vectors, uh, inside our cells, is actually coming from the particles themselves. So if I take this moving emitter, let's play the timeline, and you'll see as I move them through the flow field, the vectors are generated from the particles. And I can rotate that there, you can see, and the particles will change direction. We can obviously change the size of this emitter and more of the field will be given a direction like so. And also we could try having different angles of particles coming out of the same emitter. And you can see how cool that can be firing off the particles like so. So what effect does this have on our static field of particles? Well, currently it won't do anything because our flow field is currently set to change the direction only. So we need to go to the flow field, go to the general tab, and we're going to change the field mode to velocity. Let's increase it to 100% to start with, just make sure it moves them completely. And our speed is 200. So if I hit play, oh, let's go back there. You can see it, as the particles move through the field, it pushes them out of the way. So if I rotate these round like so, but there is something going on here and that's it quite important. And that's this emitter is actually being affected by its own uh, vectors from the flow field. So we need to go to the modifiers tab in our emitter and we need to add this exclude in there. And so now we've excluded that, the purple or the pink emitter here is actually not being affected anymore and can just drive the particles only. So you can see it's pushing our particles out of the field and we get this really cool effect where they will follow or they will move in the direction of those part of the source moving particles. So we can of course invert that so it actually becomes sort of an, a, an attraction or sorry an inversion of the speed so it's like a as they move along they kind of create a, a force behind them a little bit like a, a jet would you know like a, a jet engine would fire out the back and it would force the particles out the back. So that's quite cool. Now we have this smoothing parameter and that just helps uh, avoid a really abrupt changes in the particle direction. So if we're changing the particles direction of this particular moving set of particles, it can smooth them out. Uh, and we could demonstrate that using a direction modifier. So let's add a direction modifier and I'll put that in the modifier stack. And I'm actually going to exclude it from the static particles. I don't want the direction to drive those. I only want it to drive our moving emitter particles. So we go to the modifiers tab and I'm going to exclude that from the static particles. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to have them. So if I press play now, you'll see our particles move in the Z plus direction. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add a fall off. So a linear feed field fall off, we make it Y plus, like so. So basically when the particles get above that point, they're going to change in direction. And what I'll do is I'll take our angle off our emitter here so that the particles can go straight up. And let's point our emitter right up like so. So 90 degrees. And let's just turn our flow field off and our thing and just test this out. So you can see uh, that changes the direction. It's a bit gentle at the moment, so I'm going to increase that so it's really abrupt change in the direction. Like so. Now let's put our flow field back on. And let's have our particles moving. Uh, I'm going to turn the inversion off. Like so. And you can see as our particles are moving along like so, the change in direction is fairly gentle. Now, if I turn the smoothing down to zero, you'll see the change in direction is very abrupt in the, in the flow field. So we, we want extra smoothing. And you can actually see the effect inside the flow field and we'll get more gentle change in direction from the static particles. Okay, and of course, fall off has a big impact here as well. You can see as I change it, the, the distance the particles will have an effect 
uh, away from them from their sort from their position is uh, increased by that fall off so i hit play and you get to, you can see now how powerful this can be when we combine different particle emitters with source emitters for our flow field okay so that's all the flow flow field modes the flow modes of the flow field itself and we've taken a look through all the different types and the real fun stuff comes when you combine them together to create your own custom modifiers.